There was a reason I, I wanted to speak today. There's been so much going on in our country. And every time we step into a moment where we see the worst of our humanity, it causes deep distress. Sometimes it shakes us at the very core of our, of our being. To see the violence, the inhumanity, the instability. And, and there are so many different conversations that are had in these moments about what the problems are and what the solutions might be. And depending on your particular cultural perspective, you may think it's one thing or another. And the reason there is so much controversy and conflict about how to solve our humanity's deepest problems is that they're not simple. They're complex. One of the things that has really struck me is that over the last few years, we're almost in a cultural experiment of how much we can take how much our souls can actually take of the pressure of unexpected changes and crises and challenges and fear. And in these moments, I've seen an extreme response, the highest level of, of mental instability, extraordinary levels of inhumanity, out-of-control levels of depression and anxiety, stress, of despair. At the same time, I've seen the other side of the spectrum. Those individuals who have stepped into this moment and have stepped up. They seem to be more capable, more courageous. There are people who have optimized this moment and have more success in very tangible ways, have created more powerful companies, have expanded economies, have created new ventures, and we've seen the very best of them. Why is it this extreme response to the same circumstances? It was probably over 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago, when I was in a conversation. And back then, I worked much more as an anthropologist and sociologist and cultural analyst. And I was asked, what do you think will be the most significant psychological conversation in the decades to come? And my answer was quick. I knew exactly what it was. I said, it's going to be resilience. And I stand here in this moment, and I am absolutely certain that this is the singular characteristic that will define those who thrive and those who are overwhelmed by this moment. But one of the tricky things about resilience is that even when we want an outcome like becoming a resilient human being, we don't really understand the process of how to become resilient. Resilience is a really interesting word because it means that you have the capacity to bounce back, to spring back, to return to your original form. That's the actual, literal meaning of resilience, that no matter how much you're bent out of shape, no matter how much the environment tries to distort you or bend you or break you, you have this unexplainable capacity to return back to your original form. And one of the challenges in faith is that so many people turn to God to avoid the circumstances that would require resilience. And so we think that if we believe in God, we can avoid a more difficult life, a harsher life, a more challenging life. We can avoid the problems and difficulties and the pain and disappointment. Because after all, isn't that what giving your life to Jesus promises? But if you've been a follower of Jesus for more than five minutes, you know better than that. <laughs> you know that the tragedy of it all is that if you believe in God, you have the same problems that people who do not believe in God have. You have both the same external crises and you have the same internal crises. And that's a part of the challenge is that so oftentimes when we're facing the internal structure of our psychological being, we're often told when we have faith, oh, just believe in God. Just believe in Jesus. Just believe in the Bible. But I, I, I want to say something that I don't mean to discourage you. I just want to get to truth. There are people who believe in God and believe in Jesus and believe in the Bible, and they are psychologically shattered at the core of their being. And they're not moving to the health and wholeness that they need. Because human beings are incredibly complex. And yet the hope in this is that God actually created you. 
He knows you, and he's not overwhelmed by the complexity of who you are. So I want to take a few moments and talk to you about how to grow in resilience. I, I love this particular proverb, Proverb 24, verse 16. It says, though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. Whenever you listen to a declaration or a promise, you should always step back and look at the assumptions. It's, it's, isn't this exciting? Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. And we focus on they rise again. But before I focus on that, I start focusing on the part right before that. Wait a minute. Why should the righteous fall seven times? I mean, actually, after all, if you're righteous, should you fall at all? Isn't the proof that you're not righteous that you fell? And yet, the assumption is the righteous are going to fall. And not just once. Here he says seven times, but it's worse than you think. Because if you know anything about the Bible and the way the Bible uses numbers, the number seven is a number that's used not only when it's a number of completion, but it's a number of infinite capacity. So when it says the righteous fall seven times, he's not saying the righteous fall seven times. He says the righteous fall and they 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 will fall so many times you will not be able to count how many times the righteous fall. So in a practical sense, I go, then what's the point of being righteous if I'm going to fall? See, I think a part of the dilemma is that we actually thought that, oh, if I'm aligned with God, if I'm properly aligned with Jesus, I will never fall. And yet, God's expecting you to fall. And to fail. And to lose. And to mess up. And I don't know why, maybe in some dark way, this is very encouraging to me. <laughs> because for so long... I felt that the psychological and spiritual pressure of never messing up, of never falling, of never failing, of never losing. And in fact, the proof that I was aligned with God was that everything always worked out right for me. And then when it didn't work out right, I had to deal with, am I wrong about God or am I wrong about me or am I wrong about everything? And when I realized, no, I was just brought into the wrong story. See, if you... Entrust your life to God. And if you choose to follow Jesus, here's the promise. You're going to fall. Not just once, not just twice, not just six or seven times. It's just going to become a part of your life, so get used to it. But they rise again. See, the difference between the resilient and those who lack resilience is not whether they fail or not. It's actually the differential of one. It's not the differential of 1,000. It's not the differential of, of 100 or 10. It's just the differential of one. See, it doesn't matter how many times you fall. You just got to get up one more time than you fell. That's the power of resilience. Now, I think a part of the, the challenge of this time in which we live is that we keep looking for an easier way to do life. I mean, isn't that why we want to move to Portland? <laughs> or Austin? Isn't that why we, we want to move out to Wyoming? Who could have ever imagined that Wyoming would become so popular, that, that Idaho would be the better option? <laughs> From New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco, it's because we're trying to find a way to reduce the amount of stress in our lives rather than to find a way to elevate the amount of resilience in our lives. James says this in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. I like how he says that, because you know. Did you know? Did I know? Did I really know? Because you know that the testing... Uh, wait a minute. Why, why would you want to test my faith? Because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. There's an intimate relationship between resilience and perseverance, endurance, the capacity to keep moving forward no matter how hard life is. 
He says the only way that you get that, the only way you move toward resilience, the only way you move to this level of perseverance, of endurance, of capacity, is to have your faith tested. See, I think a lot of us, we want to have big faith, but we don't want to have big problems. What's the point of having big faith if you have no problems? You have no need for faith if you have no problems. And so if you're hearing, oh, God, I want to have bigger faith, what you're actually saying is, God, I want bigger problems. And we go, okay, I just want little faith. I just want little, little, little less faith right now, God. You're just requiring a lot of faith. The problem is that, that if the problems keep elevating and the faith doesn't elevate, we become overwhelmed. It's, it's the testing, the testing, the testing of your faith. And by the way, God never wants you to fail the test. I was never good at tests. How about you? I mean, I, I've been bad at every kind of test. It doesn't matter whether it's math or English or science or psychological assessments. I failed everything. And uh, <laughs> you'll get that later. But, um, but I had a teacher once who basically said, here are all the answers for the tests that are coming. All you have to do is study them and you will make an A. Can you believe there were still students that failed that class? Because some of us, even having the answers isn't enough to succeed. Because we do not have the internal structure to actually make the choices to win when the win is handed to us. And, and so God isn't trying to give you the win. He's trying to give you the structures that can actually win. He's not just trying to get you through. He's trying to give you the internal structures that drive you through. He's not just trying to get you the A. He's trying to make you the A. So what actually develops resilience? What, what allows us to get up one more time? To get up one more time? To get up one more time? Yeah, that's right. I just want to... Elevate three characteristics that will create resilience inside of you. And, you know, I get to talk to a lot of people who focus on peak performance, which is kind of my frustration sometimes with, with church. Because we don't really, in the whole, like, Christian conversation in the world, we're normally talking about, like, minimal performance. We're not talking about peak performance. We're just talking about how to make it through the day. And I, it's just so boring to me. It's just so, I, I know somebody should help you just make it through the day, but I don't want to just help you make it through the day. I want to teach you how to create the days that you imagine. There's a difference, and, and it's about optimizing who you are as a human being. And so the first layer of actually moving toward peak performance is developing resilience in your life. Because you cannot get to the best until you actually develop the internal structure for greatness. And so the first attribute I want you to focus on, and, and I, know, I know it's going to seem so simple that you might ignore it, you might overlook it, but the, the, the most significant attribute to, to, toward developing resilience in your life is gratitude. And I think it's interesting because over 20 years ago, I wrote a book called Uprising, and I spent a massive section talking about the psychological value of gratitude, and people are like, well, that just seems too simple. And now 20 years later, you, you, that's what you see everywhere, is that essential power of gratitude. But, but it's more than that. It's actually even neurological. I, I've had the privilege to be a part of three uh, neuro clinics around uh, the United States. Uh, not, not as a researcher, but a, as a, a patient. And, <laughs> and fortunately, I'm always able, able to leverage being a patient to actually being a participant and being, becoming a researcher. And so it's been really exciting for me. But a lot of uh, this has been because of my own neurological um, challenges. And, and so I had a lot of MRIs, a lot of brain scans, all these, you know, and a lot of different kind of tasks and things like that. And, and yet in one of those um, neuro clinics, in, this one was in Dallas, they did massive study of the human brain. And I remember taking a red eye to Dallas and I had to take all these brain assessments. I go, it's not fair because I haven't slept all night. And, uh, but I don't ever sleep, so maybe it's really exactly right. And, uh, and they said, we have discovered the lubricant of the brain. Now, some of you are really young. You're not worried about being lubricated in your brain. <laughs> but when you get older, 
See, when you're almost 64, you're, you're thinking mental lubrication, right? You know, because you, you start thinking about things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and dementia. And all, all that is because your brain becomes rigid. And as your brain rigidifies, you lose the capacity to see things like beauty and wonder, opportunity, possibilities. And so recently, I had over an hour MRI. They did this massive scan of my brain. They told me my brain was very, very young. <laughs> so I just want you to sit here for a moment and appreciate my youthful brain. See, I can shave my beard and look a little bit younger, but that's not the part of me that matters. It's that mental pliability, the ability to wake up in the morning and see opportunities and possibilities, to imagine that which does not exist, to create that which no one else can see. That's what I don't want to lose. I'd rather lose all my limbs than lose my power to imagine and create. And, and what this neuroscientist said is what they discovered is the lubricant of the brain and it is gratitude. Now they know that gratitude isn't just some soft idea. It's not just a, a spiritual attribute that you should take on to make you a better human being. If you do not want your brain to rigidify, you need to develop a life of gratitude. And if you're here right now and you have a posture of ungratefulness, I'm telling you, you may be 26, but your brain has already begun to rigidify. I, I've met a lot of people in their 20s who think like they're 120. Their brains have gone dead. They can't see new possibilities, new opportunities. All they see is what's wrong in life. All they see is what's wrong around them. Everything they see is negative. You need to listen to your self-talk and to the conversations you have with other people. Is the first thing you see is what's going wrong? Is the first thing you see what's missing? When you look at life, you only see the obstacles and the problems. Or have you trained your brain to pay attention to the beauty all around you, to look at the wonder all around you, to see the opportunities for good. I mean, if you think of your brain as a muscle, then you need to begin to, to exercise your brain's power to see opportunity and possibilities. And that will only happen when you choose a life of gratitude. Ungrateful people are dumber than grateful people. I know, it's not PC to say that. See, ungrateful people are not just less likable. Come on, you know that. Ungrateful people, bitter people, they're not just less enjoyable, they're just dumber. And so if you've chosen a posture of ungratefulness, you need to look at yourself and go, I'm lowering my IQ every day. I'm not grateful for life. I don't have enough brain cell to spare. I've spent pretty much all my life as a straight edge. I mean, I, I've just chosen pretty much all my life not to drink. And, and, and even when I didn't have faith in God, I didn't drink. And there was a reason for that, because I learned early on in my studies of neuroscience, it was that, that alcohol kills brain cells. So I was, I was probably a teenager when I thought, I don't have that many. <laughs> and I, I, I cannot afford some other people, they, have, they clearly have so many, they don't care about destroying them. But, but I felt like I needed to hold on to the few brain cells I had. <laughs> and now I know. That, that, that's a, a negative behavior that I, I can actually resist, but gratitude is a positive behavior that I actually take on. Watch my brain, because I am going to live a life of incredible, ridiculous gratitude. Yeah. How about you? In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We thought God was just focusing on your attitudes. God is actually focusing on your capacity to be optimized as a human being. When you rejoice always, when you give thanks in all circumstances, your brain expands 
Can you feel it? You ever just needed a deep breath? You ever just been on a hike in high altitude and you're just grasping for oxygen? Doesn't it feel good when you just can breathe deeply? When you are grateful, it's inhaling. Your brain is absorbing the power of unlimited imagination. But not only do we need gratitude, we need faithfulness. There's this one response that Jesus gives in a parable he tells. We, most of us might be really familiar with it. It's Jesus gives these talents, these individuals, who actually the master does in the parable. And he gives one five talents, one two talents, one one talent, and goes away, comes back some time later. The one who was given five talents grew it to ten. The one who had two grew it to five. The one who had one buried it and only had one. And when he came back, he commended the two who had increased what they had been given and then he really condemned the one who buried the talent because he was afraid to lose what he had. And so he lost the potential of what could have been created. And then Jesus says this, the master replies, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. I've always thought this parable was really fascinating because there's no miracle involved. He says, my good and faithful servant. Because when we think of the word faithful, we think, of, oh, full of faith. But actually, the word faithful comes from the etymology of the word trust. To be fair. And what he's actually saying is you're trustworthy with the little things so I can entrust to you more. Yeah, I think a huge part of the problem is that the reason we don't have internal resilience is we think God's always going to bail us out of our problems. Bail us out of our circumstances. We want God to act the way the ancient Greeks thought about with ex de machina. That somehow the gods would intervene when we have no way out. See, sometimes God doesn't want to give you a way out. Because it will make you soft. It will make you weak. It will make you dependent on the supernatural and miraculous rather than to develop the internal character of resilience that gives you the strength to power through. Faithfulness is about what you do every day. Ah, it's been a tough week for so many reasons. It's been a tough week for me with gratitude because my perspective has been so skewed. Two weeks ago or so, Kim and I had the chance, opportunity to go to Lake Como, Italy. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> the world is just not even. That is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I, I mean, we took a boat ride and there was Richard Branson's house. <laughs> and, and then there was um, Versace's house and there was... Um, George Clooney's house, and, and we were in our boat looking, oh, there's the, there's the rich, and then there's this. But it was beautiful, I had to admit, I, I, I couldn't even be mad. I was like, wow, it's beautiful. I wasn't envious, I was just like, kind of glad someone got to experience that in life. And, <laughs> and it just made me feel better, I don't know. And, and, and then we would eat gelato every day. I, like, that's like a dream, like, you know, and, and eat Italian food doesn't make you fat. I don't know how that happens. And, and it was just so amazing. And we just walked and had this beautiful time. And, and, and then Kim flew back and I went to Barcelona. Aaron met me there. We were there for four or five days. Very different. Like Como is like heaven. Barcelona is like kind of like my heaven. It's, it's like it's a section called the Gothic uh, region. And all this graffiti and small alleys and ancient buildings with great coffee shops and just walk like 10 miles every day just from coffee shop to coffee shop to coffee shop to coffee shop to, to, to lunch to coffee shop to coffee shop to coffee shop to dinner and, and you're just, I, I mean, I was just so stimulated. There were times Aaron would go, Dad, are you okay? And I'd go, yeah, yeah, why? And he goes, you're not saying anything. And I go, I know. I'm just absorbing. This is how I create. I literally, this is how I create. I just said, it's just, it's creating me. It's recreating me. I was, I was oh, just, oh my, I'm speaking. I'm sorry. I was in Barcelona. And uh, <laughs> I was speaking Spanish. I was at home. I was like, so I'm con mi gente. I estaba ahí con mi pueblo. I estaba hablando, comiendo. Yeah, un tiempo increíble. Pero, and so I was like, I'm at home, you know, and they looked like me. 
but, but with beards. And it was beautiful. And then I had to fly home, but I, I missed my flight in Amsterdam. And so I, had to, I just got on a train, went to Amsterdam, just walked to Amsterdam. And beautiful, like, canals and gorgeous houses and boats and just so much overstimulation of beauty. And, and then I flew home. And I got here, back home to L.A. And honestly, it's been a hard week. I was like, whoa, we live in an ugly city. I was like, I was like, oh, no. I was like where, where's, like, where's our Barcelona? Where's our, like, Como? Where's our Amsterdam? It's like, 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 there's our gelato. Yes, it's like, why didn't they build L.A. like by the ocean? Like, were they like on math? And like, what, why did they design the city this way? It's just like, there's just, this is what happens when there are no artists in the room going, you really should do it like that. You, you should create something beautiful. And so all week long, I've been looking at going, wow, I, I love my city. I love my city. I love my city. I love my city. <laughs> and, and just the whole, I mean, homeless everywhere and crime everywhere and disarray everywhere and, and such a lack of a... Have you ever noticed how ugly Hollywood is? It's like there's just, there's no thought to architecture and culture and beauty. And the world comes here on vacation. I want to go, stop, don't do it. Don't waste your money here. Go to Barcelona. And, uh, and I've had to re redirect and I realized, oh, what's happening now is see, I'm living in this moment of beauty where you don't find beauty, you have to create beauty. And, and I had to realign my gratitude and I've had to realign my faithfulness because <sighs> today our house is full of like cinnamon rolls and muffins and yesterday our house was full of donuts. The day before it was full of banana cream pie and the day before that fresh brownies. And I'm trying so hard, I'm trying so hard to get healthy. Like, I, I, and, and the only thing that helps me say no is how painful it is to lose weight and to be healthy. And, you know, if I eat one donut, it isn't going to ruin me, right? <laughs> but if I eat one donut every day, it will probably change my whole structure. <laughs> it's just like if I work out one time, it's not going to make me healthy. But if I work out every day, it's going to change everything about my physicality. See, I, I think most of us think that God works, quote, in the miraculous moments, and he actually works in the faithful. He, he works in the mundane, the boring, the everyday, the stuff you do every day that no one else sees. And, and here's one of the things that I've discovered about resilient people. See, resilient people are not just simply Grateful people, they see beauty and wonder and opportunity and possibility all around them. They're never overwhelmed by how bad a moment is because they always see a way through to the beauty. But there are also people who are incredibly faithful about keeping their word. Now, not just to God and not just to other people, but to themselves. And when Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant, he's not saying, wow, you did something miraculous. He actually said, you were faithful to what you were given. And because you are faithful in the little things, I can entrust you with more. Some of you keep wanting God to give you more when you have never even been faithful with the little. And the little is who you choose to be every day. And, and that's why most of us lack resilience. Because when the crisis comes, you ever notice that problems do not send you a forewarning? I'm coming. Wouldn't that be great? You know, it, it was just like, I'm about to ruin your life. <laughs> it doesn't come like that. One day, your life is awesome. The next day, it's upside down. One day, he is the love of your life. The next day, I hate his guts, right? <laughs> One day, I have the job that I dreamed of. The next day, my boss is driving me insane. It's amazing how one day can change everything and you're not ready for the crisis. You're not ready for the moment someone tells you you have cancer. So you're not ready for that moment where you've lost everything because the economy has flipped upside down. You're not ready for that moment where you thought you'd be the one who would not get fired and you were the one who were let go. See, we're not ready for those moments and that's why you have to be faithful to be ready every day 
because you don't know what day will be that day that needs you to be the best version of you. So what commitments, what promises have you made to God, to others, to yourself? Are you trustworthy with your word to you? Every decade of my life, I I, I made a decision. I'm going to redefine what it looks like to be in my 20s. I'm going to redefine what it what it means to be in my 30s. I'm going to redefine what it means to be in my 40s. I'm going to redefine what it means to be in my 50s. Every decade, I literally, as I step into the decade, I go, I'm not going to be what other people in that decade are. I'm going to be something different. And when I stepped into my 60s, other people were like, oh, man, I'm feeling old. I'm like, no. I've been waiting for 60. (laughs) See, I'm going to redefine 60s. I'm I'm going to do what 60, but no one knew could be done with 60. Watch. And... And, I, and I'm not far. I'm only like six years away from 70s. See, if I'm not dead, and I'm not worried about that. See, a lot of people are just waiting to die. I, I mean, I just want to taunt death. You can't have me until I'm ready. Because I'm going to redefine 70s. See, some of you need to make some commitments to yourself of who you're going to become. And then you need to decide what kind of man, what kind of woman you're going to be. What kind of virtues you're going to live out? What kind of character you're going to have? And then you need to make some promises to yourself and begin to make decisions every single day to be that person. Because the one who is faithful to small things, they're the ones who will be entrusted with more. But there's one last characteristic I want to just focus on for a few moments. If you want to develop resilience in your life, where no matter how many times you fall, you get up, no matter how many times you lose, you get back in the game. Oh, and by the way, early on when I was young, uh, my stepdad was a gambler. And I mean, both professionally and as a hobby. And, and so every week we would bet on NFL football games. And there's only two teams he wouldn't let me bet on, the Vikings and the Dolphins. And that's because I loved the Vikings, I hated the Dolphins. And he said, you cannot gamble when you're emotionally involved. And so I would always choose the other teams and the line and everything like that. And, I did really, really well. I was very, very good at it. And one of the ways I would pick quarterbacks, I could always identify quarterbacks that would make it in the NFL, is I would watch how they played after their worst game. See, most people watch players on their best game and go, oh, look at the potential he has. But every good athlete has the potential of having one great game and looking like they're great. I mean, every basketball player in the NBA can have a Jordan game. They can have a Jordan quarter. They can have a Jordan moment. But it's, it's how they play after their worst game that tells you whether they have the resilience to actually turn it into a career of greatness. See, you're not defined by your failures. You're not defined by your losses. You're not defined by what has caused you to fall unless you stay there. Yeah. Well, when you get up, you're now defined by what you overcame not what overtook you. And this third characteristic is humility. And it might be the singular virtue that that allows our resilience to become unstoppable. It's the defining characteristic that defines Jesus when he goes to the cross. Listen to this in Philippians chapter 2. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but, to, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Now listen to this. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So what drove Jesus to the cross was his humility. Now what's interesting to me about the whole concept of humility is that the word humility comes from this word humus, which is soil, earth. It's the same word from which we get man, Adam, clay, earth. So humility and humanity are supposed to be one and the same. See, we actually become humble when we are most human. 
when we embrace our humanity. And we are most human when we walk in our humility. And so it's fascinating to me that it tells us that Jesus, though even though he was God, he took on our earth, he took on our humanity, he became our dust, our ground like us. And in that humility gave himself on the cross as a sacrifice for all of humanity. And I think it's easy for us to see that, oh, humility is what allowed Jesus to die for us. But we don't realize that it's humility that actually pastored Jesus to be raised from the dead. It goes on, therefore, and when you see a therefore, you need to realize everything that's been said is culminating to this moment. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so what the scriptures are actually telling us is that Jesus was raised from the dead because his humility drove him to the cross. And they thought he failed. They thought he lost. They thought he had fallen. They thought he was crushed. But you cannot bring down a humble man or a humble woman. You know, every once in a while, I, I end up in a photograph with really tall people. And I'm in the back, and I, 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 I can do this. I can do that for like a second. But I'm really easy to knock down when I'm trying to be taller than I am. But you know when you can't knock me down when I'm laying on the ground? There, there's something about when you're grounded, you cannot be knocked down. And so when you fall, you're not like going, what am I doing on the ground? You go, I belong here. You, you know why people are not resilient when they look so talented and so gifted and so attractive? It's because you're shocked when you fail. You're shocked when you lose. You're shocked when you fall. How could it happen to you? You're awesome. How could it happen to you? You're more talented, more gifted, more intelligent than everyone else. How could it possibly happen to you? It cannot be your fault. That's why arrogance always looks for someone to blame. And humility always looks for something to solve. An arrogant person will always look for a person to blame. A humble person will always look for a problem to fix. Now, yeah, you ever seen those movies where the king knocks over his wine? He always blames the servant. Who put the cup there? Because it's, it's never the king's fault when the cup is knocked over. And you never see the servant go, you knocked it over, sir. <laughs> you just see the servant grab a towel and clean it up. See, a lot of us who are not resilient, we think we're the king. And when we knock the cup over, we just look for someone to blame. Imagine if Jesus had taken that posture. He'd have walked amongst and said, who ruined this world? I think it was you. Like, oh, it was him. And, like, you know, I, and, and instead of coming to condemn us, he came to free us and forgive us. Jesus did not come as the king to blame someone for knocking over the cup. He came as the servant to clean up the mass that we made. So let me just leave you with this thought. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to lose. And the great danger will be that you'll spend your life blaming other people rather than realizing this is the opportunity of a lifetime. See, I, I just, I want to be so clear. I'm not here today because I've never fallen. I'm not here because I've never failed. I'm not here because I've never lost. I'm here because I got up one more time than I fell. And I am sick and tired of people getting crushed under the rubble of their failures. I'm sick and tired of watching people deconstruct internally, be so psychologically damaged they cannot see any hope in life. I'm tired of watching people struggle with suicide, 
Not being able to find one reason to live. I am so tired of the overwhelming narrative of depression and despair, anxiety and stress. Who told you it wasn't supposed to be hard? I was just in a conversation with a leader in the East Coast and he called me and said, everything's falling apart and it was a horrible situation. And then he said, I, I, we think we're just gonna go ahead and not fight the situation and, and take a year and just rest. He kept saying, I'm tired. I could hear it in his voice, he was tired. He said, I'm tired and I think we're just gonna take a year and rest. And I could tell everyone else was telling him, yeah, that, that's what you should do. You're tired, just take a year and rest. And I thought, oh, he shouldn't have called me. <laughs> and after about the sixth or seventh time, I heard him say, I'm just so tired, I'm just gonna take a year and rest. And I just finally interrupted, I said, you don't think I'm tired? He's like 30 years younger than me. He's tired. I said, you don't think I'm tired? And I said, I've been tired my entire life. <laughs> Who told you it wasn't supposed to be hard? Someone's telling you your life is not supposed to be hard. Someone's telling you your dreams are supposed to come easy. Someone out there is telling you the government should take care of you. That someone else should pay your bills. That someone else should help you succeed. Someone is out there telling you, you should have a safety net. Who is telling you that life is supposed to be easy? Do not choose the easy path. Do not choose the easy road. Do not choose the easy way. Choose a life that demands courage that demands resilience, that demands strength. Choose the hard path and make a difference in this life. And let me tell you what will happen. Let's remain on our feet. In Isaiah 40 verse 29, it tells us this. He gives strength to the weary. Are you tired? He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I want you to listen to me. You will have the opportunity to choose an easy path that will allow you to be the lesser version of you. But that's not the path Jesus calls you to. He calls you to step into the fullness of the life he created you to live. That life is gonna take courage. It's gonna take strength. It's gonna take determination. But if you let him, he'll build the resilience in you. No matter how many times you fall, you'll rise, you'll rise, you'll rise. Would you stand with me and pray with me? Just bow your head just for a moment. Maybe you're here and you've never really trusted Jesus with your life. You haven't trusted God with your future, your dreams, your fears, your, your doubts. Maybe you've been angry with God because it's been so hard. Maybe just you lost your faith because you, you thought believing in God would make life just a little bit easier. I just want you to know that's not the promise. I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus so that he can build in you the resilience to choose the hard road ahead. Greatness is hard. Being heroic is hard. Being faithful is hard. If you're here right now and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, I just want you to pray a simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. That's it. Right now, just tell him. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. This is where it begins. And if you're here right now and it may be the most terrifying thing you've ever done, 
you may be surprised that you're actually ready to do it. But if in this moment, your prayer is, Jesus, I give you my life, and you'd like for me to pray for you as you cross this line of faith and put your trust in Jesus, I want you right now just to raise your hand and say, this is my moment. I just prayed and asked Jesus to come into my life. Jesus, I give you my life. If that's you, just raise your hand right now, and I want to pray for you, but I want to see you. I want you to take this the smallest act of courage just to raise your hand and say, that's me. Today, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Beautiful. Anyone else? Beautiful. Anyone else? Right now, this is your moment. Find the courage to step out of the obscurity into this moment. Father, I thank you for the women and men who in this moment have opened up their lives to you. God, I am so tired of watching people fall apart because life is so hard. And God, I, I pray for them that they would know that they belong to you, that you've come to live within them. But God, I also pray that you'd begin to build in them a resilience that makes them unstoppable. That there'd be no obstacle, no circumstance, no failure, no challenge that could ever hold them down. They would always rise up like a phoenix out of the ashes to soar again. I thank you, Father. God, I pray for this room. God, I pray for this room that we would be the men and women who do not choose the easy way, but that we make ourselves available to you. God, give me the great challenge. Give me the hard road. Give me the big problems. Give me the weighty issues. God, teach me how to be stronger. Teach me, God, how to carry more. God, teach me how to walk in resilience for the righteous fall seven times. And then they rise again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.